I think we are a lot of um, yeah, the props are some device. space advanced in this PhD. Yes, but uh, as it stops and the case advanced in this PhD, because we can understand the events. So, what is the presence is uh, less than the problem of this PhD. Can we take a few minutes to understand? Inside the last one, most so the idea of the roll-up is also to give uh, a roll-up to each of our partners uh, is which you're interested. So you can have one and uh, place it somewhere in your research labs in uh, your spaces um, because it's very important uh, for us and for you that we have some visibility also in the companies. Um, because uh, all three years we again have the situation that uh, is something like to decide if they want to continue the partnership with the chair. And uh, the more they are aware of what the chair offers uh, to the company, the better. Um, yeah. On it, we see the uh, four different axes of research. Um, we see some key facts about the chair. We see that it's a quality okay. chair. Of course, we see the uh, partners of the chair at the bottom. Um, we have the chair in 2016, which was quite uh, nice because it's quite old. Um, yes, the left side, we have our um, four axis of activity, it's of course, research. Um, then we have the speakers. And we have the MOOCs. Um, and we tell a little bit more about that. Uh, all, about all four axes um, are Can you hear me? À distance, vous nous entendez? Oui, on nous entend. Oui, c'est bon. C'est bon. Okay, great. So, hi everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to give an update on my uh, thesis, uh, which is entitled "Optimization of Security Risk for Learning on Heterogeneous Data." It's under supervision of Tomar Ber, John Lennart, and Laura Potel. So I will go directly to the presentation for the content. So here we work on uh, uh, we work on uh, we have two sites 
uh, we have the attacker side and the defender side. In the defender side, we have uh, an intrusion detection system that protects the network uh, from the malicious packet and uh, and also it's protect uh, the system of uh, in this network. Uh, the role of the attacker here is to uh, uh, to send a packet with malicious impact like DOS or plot attack in order first to evade the detection of the intrusion detection system and second to have an impact on the systems. Uh, this is the regular type of attack and then there's we have if this regular type of attack is failed we have a uh, meta attack it's called the aviation attack. Uh, this aviation attack consists of modifying uh, the well-known regular, regular attack for the intrusion detection system in order to make them undetectable. Uh, this aviation attack also uh, have two goals the first one and the first uh, purpose is to uh, evade the detection of the intrusion detection system, and the second one is to preserve the impact of the regular uh, malicious uh, uh, activity or packet. Uh, and because here we are working on <coughs> data, uh, the attacker and the defender model uh, could be uh, asymmetrics, meaning that uh, the attacker uh, could have different resources than the defender, or the attacker could uh, use some uh, uh, flawless from uh, the data set quality and so on. So if we zoom in on the intrusion detection system and how the data pipeline uh, worked for this uh, intrusion detection system, uh, first we start from the problem space where we have uh, the real uh, attack generator like Metasploit, Nmap, and so on. We have the real uh, uh, network, normal network. We gather them by the sensor gather this data and uh, uh, we captured it as a pickup file. And then we move from uh, this uh, problem space, what we call the feature space in the network data analysis, where we uh, do the packet pre-processing pre when we choose uh, the features we want, the number of features, uh, the number of samples, and so on. Uh, usually, this is provided by a CSV file. Uh, uh, in modern data set, we can see uh, a lot of data set uh, to our knowledge that have the pickup files, uh, but all the data set provide the uh, CSV file, like uh, NSLKDD that provide only the CSV file, but not the pickup files. And the other data set like CIC IDS 2017, they provide the pickup file and the CSV files. Uh, but our knowledge, uh, not all of this data set or all this data set, they don't work on uh, the real problem space or all the problem space that we have. Uh, but basically, this work will focus on uh, the feature space. Uh, if you want to read more about the uh, problem space, you can uh, refer to this paper by Perazzi. Uh, they more uh, work on that. Uh, basically, when we have when we move to the feature space, uh, we need to have a good quality data set. We have uh, the, uh, we need to work on uh, the size of this data set. Uh, so uh, this is uh, this is uh, one of uh, the factors that we need to care of in order to have a, a good uh, uh, machine learning model. Uh, then we go to the feature preprocessing space where we uh, work on uh, the, uh, the samples, uh, uh, the bad samples. Uh, we clear this data set. Uh, and also we uh, work deal with uh, the null values and something like that and we do the normalization like min max normalizations and we fit all this data to the machine learning model or the classifier so the intrusion detection system here is a classifier uh, based on a supervised learning meaning that we have the label for the uh, for each packet or for each sample uh, we can also work on uh, anomaly detection that is unsupervised learning, but in this work we focus on uh, the supervised learning. And then the final step after the training, we have the traffic classification, uh, mm -hmm. where the model classifies a packet as uh, normal or attack. And if we focus more on this classification, uh, it's look back to something like that. So we have uh, the, the IDS discriminate between 
in the normal uh, samples and the feature, uh, which is the green one, and the malicious packet, which is the red one. And here, uh, we need to talk about how adversarial sample work. So the role of adversarial sample is uh, because it's a type of mediation attack. So uh, we modify, we take a regular malicious samples that's very well known for the intrusion detection system. And uh, we, mo we, we modify it as uh, we modify it. And the purpose is to uh, change the label for this uh, uh, malicious sample. So change the boundary uh, from attack to normal. Uh, this is uh, usually done by uh, adding some noise to uh, the features of the regular uh, malicious samples. We uh, present this to this uh, will be the noise and the regular malicious packet will be the input for what's called the attack generator and the output will be a perturbation. The perturbation should uh, ensure two things. First, that the new mutated sample uh, should uh, be a stealth attack, meaning that uh, can uh, the IDS cannot detect it, and we still have to preserve the impact, the uh, original impact of the regular uh, regular uh, malicious sample. Usually, uh, in different domain, in image domain, they apply this on all the features they have. Uh, so, if we take, so if someone from different domain came and want to apply this is usually they think about they apply this on all the features for uh, like here for the dust sample. Uh, but this could uh, end up with yes, we can uh, we can evade the detection, but the impact of uh, the attack if we change some features for some important features for the functionality of the attack, we could end up with no impact on the system. So uh, we need to have some knowledge uh, about uh, the domain we have. Uh, so we uh, be sure that we don't change some uh, features uh, that change the functionality of the attack when we do the perturbation. And this is what we will call uh, a neighborhood of an attack sample. So this neighborhood of the attack sample, it's uh, mainly when uh, we can apply the change on uh, the features uh, on uh, this uh, uh, malicious, uh, regular malicious samples. Uh, and uh, we, we will see later that in the uh, literature, we have different definition of this neighborhood. So and each neighborhood will give us a different subspace of uh, uh, adversarial samples, uh, even for the same type of attack in the same data set. Uh, OK, I will talk about this in later uh, slide, but Adversarial samples, they are not used by one side, by the attacker side. We can use them by uh, the attacker and the defender side in order uh, to do uh, what's called adversarial training. Uh, in adversarial training, we inject adversarial samples into the training data set of sample detection systems in order to have better and cheaper, cheaper training data set. Uh, better data set because we have uh, uh, so the, the IDS is trained on more uh, adversarial machine samples, so it's more robust and cheaper because we don't need the purpose of adversarial training. So we don't need to test all these new samples uh, on the system. But in order to do that, we have to respect, as in the attacker side, we have to respect two constraints. The aviation constraint means that we have uh, the, 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 the new sample, the new generated sample, or the new adversarial sample can uh, evade the detection of the IDS. And second uh, is the semantic constraint, meaning this is related to the neighborhood uh, that we need to define in order to have uh, a good or a real impact on the system. Uh, so the key here is to understand this semantic constraint and this evasion constraint. Uh, but we looked up in the literature and uh, to find if there's a, a perfect definition of this neighborhood. Uh, what we find in the literature is that we have a different neighborhood. The first one is uh, really specific for NSL KDD neighborhood because the authors of this uh, data set, uh, they provide uh, 
what they call the functional and uh, non-functional features of uh, uh, an attacking class. Uh, so basically, here the subspace that we uh, here uh, is based on modifying uh, the non-functional features of any type of attacking class. This is what we uh, called in our uh, latest paper the impactful neighborhood of an attack sample or ENO. Uh, the second one uh, it's based on uh, statistical criteria. So if we take the CIC IDS 2017 as an example. Uh, we can see even the writers of the authors of this data set, uh, they apply different uh, statistical criteria in order to uh, have the, the most prevalent functional feature. Uh, and we can see others that other people that have defined their, their own definition of uh, statistical criteria in order to have this subspace of uh, uh, data set of adversarial examples. Uh, the second one is based on uh, expert knowledge, uh, also for the CIC IDS. So even uh, to our knowledge, I just found these two papers that work on based on expert knowledge. Uh, these two uh, papers they rely on the same criteria in order to analyze the uh, the data set, but they end up with two different uh, subspace of uh, features. Uh, most relevant function feature for let's say for those attack. And the final one here is uh, where the people they don't care about this neighborhood, so they apply uh, like in the image domain, they apply the uh, the modification of all the features. So this is uh, what we found the different neighborhoods that we found in the literature. Uh, so uh, how this related to the data quality issue. Whatever the neighborhood we have, uh, we need to understand how this uh, could affect the data set quality issues. There's a very well known uh, issue in the data set in all the in all the machine learning domain. It's called uh, what's called the contradictory data set. So if you move from problem space to feature space, and the feature space, if the features uh, of two different activities have the same value but they have different label. We call this a contradictory sample. And if we have a contradictory sample, we have a, a contradictory data set. Usually in uh, other domain, uh, they work to resolve this, but if we have a definition of neighborhood in uh, network domain, we could end up uh, by, uh, we have this problem again. So uh, because, uh, no one, to our knowledge, uh, work on uh, because the, in the neighborhood we have some functional features that are uh, the same for uh, the normal and the attack samples so in the uh, training data set. So we could end up we uh, have the same problem again when we do adversarial training. Uh, so based on that, we define uh, several threats. So the third, the third poison threat, which is uh, here, uh, the, uh, the attack of other defenders, they don't know about the, the neighborhood, so they don't define the neighborhood. Uh, so they apply the, the uh, change or the generator on all the features. So we have the result of this, will we have bad samples that could affect the availability of normal samples because, because we, can't, uh, we could end up with uh, uh, normal features in the adversarial training data set that they built as an attack. The second one is a testing cost threat. Uh, here, uh, uh, the defender or the attacker know about the neighborhood, but they don't know how to explore it. So uh, they need to uh, test each uh, each packet or each malicious packet, each adversarial malicious packet, uh, in order to extend the data set, and this is very costly. Uh, the third threat is the confusion normal sample threat. So if you have this uh, uh, confusion number threat uh, that are very like the, the, uh, the attack samples in the training data set, we could impair the robustness of the intrusion detection systems. And we have the best aviation attack stress, and this is specific type of set of uh, inside the data set that uh, if the attacker know it, so in the training data set, we have these uh, samples that very look 
very look like uh, uh, the, conf the confusion normal samples. And uh, so if the attacker know this, uh, this set inside the data set, it will be very easy for him to evade the intrusion detection system. Based on that, we uh, provide some mitigations. So for the first two threads, the mitigation will be to uh, understand the neighborhood. So when we understand the neighborhood, we could mitigate the first two threads. So mainly the mitigation we provide is the, for the second, for the third, and for the fourth thread. So the, the first thread, uh, the first mitigation we provide is the sample removal. When we remove the confusion normal samples from the training data set. Uh, the pessimistic relabeling is here when uh, we relabel uh, the confusion normal samples as an attack sample inside the training data set. So it's like cheap tra uh, adversarial training. And the first one is the oversampling of peak when we increase the ratio of uh, generating the peak samples in the training data set. Uh, moving to the practical part, so the objective of the experimentation is to assess how the strikes can impact the performance of the IDS. And second is to assess the efficiency of the proposed mitigation against the threat. And in order to do so, we mod we uh, define three metrics. The first one is the detection rate, which is the basic metric, uh, which reflects the proportion of correctly detected malicious traffic. And based on that metric, we uh, define two other metrics: the aviation increase rate, uh, uh, which uh, measures the performance of the attack generator, so which from the attacker point of view, and the aviation reduction rate, which measure uh, the robustness of an intrusion de detection system against the adversarial sample, so it's from the defender point of view. Moving to the results, so to assess the criticality, criticality of the threats, uh, we need first to assess the, uh, to have a different size of data set. Uh, like here, uh, IDS OD, it's the, the IDS here is trained on the original data set. IDS 81, it's trained on adversarial things that have uh, one time the size of uh, I, the OD, and 82 have two times, it's two times bigger than OD, 83 is five times bigger, and 84 uh, is uh, 10 times bigger. We can see that we have this linear effect. Um, so we, we improve here uh, the detection of this uh, adversarial malicious samples. But also, uh, we have a higher cost when we move to a bigger data set, bigger adversarial training data set. But the question here are we are really uh, protected against all the adversarial samples? In order to do so, uh, we evaluate the robustness of this uh, uh, robust IDS against uh, elements from adversarial elements from big set and adversarial elements from non big set. The blue one is uh, from the non peak set. Uh, we Okay, sorry, we lost the connection in the room. So, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, okay, now if we uh, evaluate the performance of uh, adversarial samples against this robust IDS by a split. Uh, between the peak, peak element and the non-peak element, we can see that the detection rate on the non-peak element, it's, it's work very well. Uh, even it's uh, on IDS 84, it has the same performance on the original malicious samples. But if we look at the uh, orange bars, it's the, first, the detection rate against the, uh, the peak element. And we can see even the most robust IDS uh, cannot uh, it's failed against this type of uh, adversarial samples. So uh, the, real, the threat here is real and it's very effective. So uh, 
the first mitigation we provide is mitigation on the peak element. So we test our mitigation, our proposed mitigation against uh, the peak element, and we can see that uh, we test it on IDS with uh, the same size of 82. Uh, so if we remove uh, the confusion normal samples or relabel this confusion normal samples as an attack, we can see that we have an improvement from 6% to about 20% against uh, detecting uh, against this uh, peak element. Uh, but if we use the third mitigation, which is the oversampling technique, uh, we can see that uh, the improvement uh, is from 20% to about 39%. So it's about uh, two times better uh, when you use the oversampling technique. Uh, the question here, if so, when we do the oversampling technique, we focus on one type of uh, of attack more than the other. So we need to test if this will be generalization on all the adversarial samples. And to, to do so, uh, we apply different, uh, we, we train different uh, detection system with different size of, uh, with different oversampling size of uh, the big element inside 82. So like 82, uh, 10, it's 10% of the size of the data set is from the peak set, and 90% is uh, from uh, the other adversarial samples. Uh, we can see that we reach a stability between 20 and 50%, and on the 57%, uh, percent, uh, the IDS doesn't work well. Uh, so we have a trade-off here. We need to be, to be uh, cautious about the size of uh, the big elements that we need to uh, integrate, to put in uh, the adversarial training data set. And the result here, we, the, the result here shows that we are not just improved on the big element, we also improve on all the adversarial element as in IDS uh, 25, it's about we improve uh, the IDS, uh, the blue one here. Uh, so even uh, on the regular IDS uh, adversarial training, trained on size of 82, that without the mitigation, we can see that the performance is about 40, uh, 0.4 on ARR, it's improved to 0.6 uh, on uh, IDS 82.25. So, and also this is good result because we know the margin between the performance of IDS of size 82 and uh, IDS of size 83, which is five times bigger than the original data set. Okay, so uh, conclusion, we identify the main threat that lead to extending the contradictory set during adversarial training. We provide the countermeasures that mitigate the effect on non empty uh, EC uh, extradictory data set. And this all work done on one definition of uh, the neighborhood, which is ENA. Uh, this work uh, was uh, published on uh, the secret uh, conference. Uh, now we are working on widening the investigation on other data set, mainly we will uh, investigate uh, how uh, uh, this threat and mitigation works with CIC IDS 2017. Uh, we have a paper we need to publish uh, next month about that. Uh, then we want to investigate the applicability, applicability of this concept on unsupervised learning and uh, uh, we want to develop a domain-driven approach in order to explore the most relevant neighborhood. This is it. If you have any question, please do not hesitate. correctly the idea is to do super sampling in the sense that more data is created than is there in order to train another algorithm. That means you have one algorithm that reduces for the data generation and you have another one that gets trained. Um, is, or did you look at the interrelation between the two algorithms so that the data set that you create is corresponding to the algorithm that you want to learn or does it have any side effects um, that you have any uh, Synthetic generation of the data on the learning. Okay, so if I understood the question well, uh, what we did, what we did here in this work is to uh, we have the adversarial training. Uh, it's very well known. 
technique to uh, defend against the adversarial network. Usually people uh, apply this on all uh, uh, the samples or the data set. Uh, what we did here uh, is to, uh, we focused on uh, a specific type of uh, the samples, which is the best aviation attack samples uh, in the data set, in the training data set, and we generate more uh, samples from this. Because, uh, I should mention this before, this uh, set in the NSLKDD, because we are working on uh, NSLKDD here, it's 3% of the data set. So 3%, if we uh, focus on this 3%, we can see that we have uh, improved the uh, detection by about 20% we focus on this. The answer to my question, um, but to ask it a little bit differently, would it or could it also make change make sense to change the um, running behavior of the neural network that you are training so that you? Um, so we don't change the algorithm. It's the same algorithm. Yeah, yeah, but uh, like, um, could, could there be more efficient methods? Because at the moment you say like okay the algorithm is kind of a black box and the thing that you change is the training data and yeah. then you still have overfitting, underfitting, and so on. And by generating more data, you have a better fit and you want to improve the learning there. And the question that the original one also it goes into the direction: Is this the most efficient method to train an algorithm or? Did you come up with um, some papers and say, yeah, no, it's a good idea, but you can also use it. Yeah, okay, we can relate this to one uh, one techniques in the literature. It's called ensembling technique. In the ensembling technique, uh, we focus on uh, each uh, classifier box on one type of uh, attacks. So if we compare this to the literature, it could be something like the ensemble technique. So. It is the best efficient way, uh, maybe, we don't know. Okay, cool, thank you very much. That's four questions. Yeah, maybe just a basic point to read. Well, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I have a basic question about the machine learning algorithm that we are using to classify between the normal data and the adversary data, which is a neural network, I guess, or? Yeah, we use the deep learning neural network. Yeah, okay, okay, and so we, what's the accuracy of this neural network? Yes, the accuracy on the regular training is about, uh, on NSLKDD is about, uh, usually we talk about detection rate here, so it's 84%. Uh, 84%, okay. okay. And maybe just a second question. So the overall objective of the thesis is to, I mean, to allocate the right counter measures to uh, make the data clean or something like this, no? Uh, no, it's to find some uh, shortcoming inside the data set quality uh, based on heterogeneous data and so on. Okay. But, yes, uh, at the beginning, we would have this kind of uh, objective saying that as soon as you have a, a model of uh, uh, cost, uh, amount of data you need to counter a certain level of attacker, so you can uh, finish it in terms of gains. Exactly. That, uh, what it, was the intent, it was yeah. the intent, but uh, just to be, because it's a decision from the supervisor. <laughs> but, uh, here, uh, one thing is that, uh, the question that, that has been asked with the some learning thing is that, the problem is that people don't really, really know which part of the dataset need to be of assist. Yeah, so it's the and this one, oh, this yeah. one, we, we have uh, some kind of criteria. Uh, each time people define that the certain they define implicitly in neighborhood, and we tell them, okay, if you have this neighborhood, do the work of checking your quality. It's your quality, not our. Yes. Because it's your region. And that's the, the, the trick that's really changed because in other contributions, people uh, come with their criteria of uh, statistical importance and so on. In, here, instead, we say, you have a neighborhood, so do the work of cleaning your data set. And it's been it's really a different uh, point of view about the problem because uh, here, it's it's not our uh, task to tell people which neighborhood is the right one. If they want to use one, they are responsible for the data quality issues they create in their data set through addressing them. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's all what I, I have been thinking of. 
that may be like a side note. It may be the next step uh, on which we can work on. Like there are a lot of efficient uh, algorithms, techniques to allocate efficiently the right countermeasures with the right cost, like uh, knapsack side problem or DID problem, defend the attack, defend the problem. So maybe it can it could be the next step. Yeah, we. Uh... Basically, uh, Jean Lenet, that is uh, the, one of the supervisors of his PhD, is expert in uh, game theory for mm -hmm. best allocation strategies. So we were planning at the beginning to use this kind of thing, but up to now, uh, our first uh, first objective is to uh, to check what this notion of neighborhood can bring us, and especially perhaps we we would like one of the things that we would like to do perhaps is to show that for instance side effects like uh, shortcut effects and things like that that have no real explanation. So perhaps they could be related to the to this thing of the neighborhood. So perhaps if we have some kind of response to those other phenomena and we can show that it's come from there, we will we would be very happy. So thank you. I was I was just wondering um, the learning you are doing is based on multi classes, for example. For what? Uh, in the data set. The data yeah. set you are you are using in order to do the learning, you are doing it at the at the level of features. Features yeah. extracted from, for example, IP traffic. Uh, it's usually this is because it's an SLKD, so we have this uh, static feature space. So we don't know how they gather this information. Oh, okay. You, you could talk about it. You have done the experiments on CIC IDS, so okay. CIC IDS is it's IP traffic. Yeah. So, <laughs> so IP traffic, so you can focus on the headers or payload, and uh, which level do you go? Uh, usually they focus on the header of the packet, so they remove this meta. Uh, metadata like the IP source or uh, something like that. Uh, usually, they, uh, the only thing that we have in the metadata is the uh, IP source, uh, the destination port. This is the only one that uh, stay on the metadata. Okay. But other metadata are like the length of the packet, uh, something like that. Okay, but so all time focusing on uh, on uh, features extracted from IP diagrams. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that, yeah. Is it, is it going inside, for example, the payload of the diagrams? No, not in the payload. Uh, it's work on, uh, I said, the header of okay. this packet. Yeah, thank you. And the, the work is very nice. I think the, the results are very interesting. Uh, I what you want about that asset, we were in touch with the EDF and me, and we are, but, but it's on my side, we were um, planning to try to apply also this analysis on the data set uh, from, from EDF inside the chain. Okay. Thank you. Like I said, great question. Thank you. Hey, uh, let's uh, thank Hassan once again.